Now we've come to the last two of the great foundation doctrines, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. In this present session, I will be dealing with the resurrection of the dead, and then in the following session, I'll be dealing with eternal judgment. We, we need to understand the meaning of the word resurrection. The Greek word that's translated means to stand up out of. So resurrection is standing up out of death and out of the grave. In the scripture we've just quoted, we saw that man consists of three elements, spirit, soul, and body. It's important to understand that it's the body that dies, and it's the body that will be resurrected. The spirit and the soul never need to be resurrected because they've never passed into death. So we are talking about the resurrection of the body. This is very important. Now, I want to deal a little bit this morning with what the Bible shows about what happens to people after they die. I've discovered that this is a matter of universal interest. It doesn't really matter what nationality or what culture you belong to. Everybody is interested to know what happens after death. And the Bible gives a pretty clear picture, and I'm going to try to outline this picture and then show how it will affect the resurrection. Um, in Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 26, <clears throat> Jesus gives us his picture of what happens. Uh, and I want to point out that this is never called a parable. There's the parable, the word parable is not used in connection with this. We'll start with Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously or lived luxuriously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from here, from there, pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father Abraham, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And how true that proved in experience. Even when Jesus rose from the dead, those who did not believe Moses and the prophets did not recognize what had happened. That's a very solemn thought. Sometimes we expect some tremendous supernatural visitation and say if that happens, we'll be convinced. But God says, you have my word. That's all you need. If you believe it and obey it, it will take you through. Now I want to point out certain features that are indicated by this story of the rich man and Lazarus. There are five features. First of all, there was persistence of personality after death. 
The rich man was still the rich man, and Lazarus was still Lazarus. Neither of them lost their identities. Now some people teach us that after death everything just fades away and there's nothing left. That's not scriptural. We continue in the same personality after death as we lived in in life. Secondly, there was recognition of persons. The rich man recognized Lazarus and he recognized Abraham and Lazarus recognized the rich man. Third, there was recollection of life on earth. Both the rich man and Lazarus could recall the circumstances of their lives before they died. Fifth, there was a consciousness of their present condition. The rich man was in torment, his tongue burning with fire. Lazarus was in comfort and peace in the bosom of Abraham. And fifthly, there was a complete separation between the righteous and the unrighteous. Each of them had an appointed place and neither could cross from one to the other. Let me add, the, let me say those five things again because they're very, very important. And they contradict a lot of theories that are being put around today. Number one, there was persistence of personality, no loss of identity. Number two, there was recognition of persons. Number three, there was recollection of life on earth. Number four, there was a consciousness of present conditions after death. And number five, there was a complete separation between the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, what happened to those who died before Jesus himself died and rose from the dead? Because that event bisected human history. And the destiny of souls before and after the death and resurrection of Jesus is not the same. The death and resurrection of Jesus produced a change, actually, in the whole universe. It was the most decisive event in the history of the universe, and it affected what happened to those who died. Let's deal now with what happened before the death of Jesus. We've seen already in this story of the rich man and Lazarus that all departing souls passed into a place which is called in Hebrew Sheol and in Greek Hades. And the Greek word Hades means the unseen world. So all alike, whether righteous or unrighteous, passed into this unseen realm called Hades or Sheol. This was a place of departed souls. But there were two completely separate areas for the righteous and the unrighteous. And notice everybody was either righteous or unrighteous, as I was saying yesterday. There's nothing in between. You can't be halfway righteous and halfway unrighteous. You've got to end up in one or other of those two places. The, the area for the righteous is called Abraham's bosom, meaning, I suppose, that Abraham was the father of all who believe, welcomed them there, and comforted them. That's my understanding.